Good morning. morning. Hope you all are having a blessed day so far, and I hope that it remains a blessed day. I know I am blessed to be here in your presence and in the house of God, where we will lift up his name in praise, where we will commit our hearts to serve and follow him, and where we will listen for how he is speaking to us today. Does anyone have any announcements? Nope, none? Okay. Um, I have one that is um, for the leadership. Um, We will need to have a call charge conference um, to formalize the uh, cooperative parish. We will be doing that jointly with uh, La Crosse and North Judson. So if you're on the leadership uh, team, kind of let me know if there are any uh, dates or times that won't work very well so that we can try to coordinate between the three churches when to have that. Uh, it'll probably be, we're looking at uh, March or early April perhaps as a time frame for that. But if there are no other announcements, I believe our uh, Ignite program has an announcement. So if they will come and announce. What is the call announce? Sure, nice. Do you announce? Up there for us, and hopefully you can see it. Um, well, apparently this is our night group. Thanks, girls. <laughs> um, so we wanted to share with you that um, we did do the shoe boxes this Christmas, and it was a huge success. I did. <coughs> and um, so uh, Carrie and Kate uh, logged on, and we got to see where our shoe boxes went, which I thought was way cool. Um, so if you can kind of see the stars, um, um, there's the, the two kind of purple ones. Um, and oh. so, can you guys see them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, one uh, one bunch of boxes went to uh, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, Benin or Benign Africa, um, and then the other one went to and I always forget this. It's not Nigeria. It is Ukraine. Ukraine, thank you, the Ukraine. So in two separate parts of the world, right? So um, anyways, I thought everyone would really enjoy seeing uh, a visual as to where those boxes went to and um, and be as excited as as we were when we saw that. So um, we, I think we'll try and get uh, more labels so we can, um, I'm not sure if you like register them or something, but you can, then you can see where uh, more boxes go to. So. Um, hopefully we can do that again next year. Is there a charge for that? Or Not it? for the tracking, no. That's part of the shipping. So, so um, anyways, we'll do more next year and hopefully they'll be going to other, we'll be going to other different places. So we wanted to share that with you because we thought that was really cool. Thank you. And even here in Hannah, the love of Christ could reach out from us across the world, across the globe. Um, and um, that's really going to be an important part of our message today about the witness that we have um, here in the world. So thank you all. And um, if anybody wants to go and visit those places, feel free to take Especially Ukraine right now. That would be a fun place, right? Yeah. Um, all right, well, if there's nothing else, let us open our worship with prayer. Are you guys going to go to the other side? Or? Oh, well, then I have to change my prayer. No, not really. Don't be paranoid. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Father of the Son, Jesus Christ, Sender of the Holy Spirit, as we gather together this morning to worship you, Help us to have a living encounter with you, with the three in one. May our lives be touched. May our minds be filled with knowledge of you. May our hearts be filled with love for you and for our neighbor. And may our lives reflect your glory through our humble acts of service, through our humble words, 
and through all that we do. We pray, Lord, that through this hour of worship, that our lives might be enriched so that we might enrich the world around us, all for the sake of Jesus Christ, our holy King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us uh, sing our opening hymn, Amazing Grace. And as the ushers come forward, taking inspiration from how the shoeboxes went to Africa and Ukraine, imagine what God can do with every gift that we give, not just the envelopes and the checks, but with our hearts, with our minds, with our service, with our lives. In God's hands, we can make a huge difference. But the really miraculous thing is, when we reach out and serve others and witness to others and love others, especially those who are difficult ones to love, our own hearts are touched and we receive grace upon grace. So let us give thanks as we give our offerings for all that God does for us, even with the little that we do for God.
We pray that our true offering be our very lives, our whole selves. Receive all that we give to you, Lord, and use it for your purposes, that the world might know the truth of Jesus Christ, that they might experience saving grace through Christ, that they might have life with you eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. And I neglected this morning to look to see who our reader was, but as our reader comes forward this morning, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to have an encounter with God through the words of Scripture. Scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, the resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you were paid, you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared, appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what I preach. This is what you believe. This is the word of God for the people. And thanks be to God. Thank you, Mike. Please pray with me. Show us the way, Lord. Take us back to the good news that was proclaimed to us. And may we hear today good news again. And may we live the good news, spread the good news, place our hope in the good news, and trust indeed that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the good news. In his name we pray, amen. So we're still in our love never ends sermon. But we jumped ahead from chapter 13 to chapter 15. Um, so you might want to go and look at what's in chapter 14 at some point this week. But we were talking about love last week. Love in the context of a community struggling with, we'll call it a variety of opinions and ideas. And that had built on our talking about our call. That we are called to serve God in the context of a diverse and sometimes divided church and world. And that the calling comes out of the gifts of God, that God has given to each and every one of us, that we might please God, and serve God, and serve one another. And it's all about love. And Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, is trying to encourage them not to be of one mind on every little thing, but to be of one heart and mind in 
the one thing, the first thing, the thing that drew every Christian to Christ, and that was the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news being that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born as a human being, taking on human flesh like us, sharing with us in the experience the difficulties of living in this created world. And that Christ taught us about God and the kingdom of God. And doing so caused him to be crucified. But God did not let that be the last word. He raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. And many people were witnesses to that. And then Jesus ascended to heaven. And even after ascending, people still had personal encounters with Jesus Christ. Paul was one of those. You may well remember the story of Paul on the road to Damascus. He was persecuting the church, trying to stamp out this growing group of people that were followers of Jesus Christ because he believed that the grace that they were preaching was against and would lead people astray from following the law of God. But Paul, who in this version says that he was abnormally born, other versions say untimely born, but Paul did not have the privilege of meeting Jesus Christ while Jesus walked this earth in a physical body. But he did have a face-to-face -face encounter with the risen and ascended Christ. And Paul was transformed. Sometimes we call it the conversion of Paul. And I don't think that's quite accurate. I don't think Paul was converted. I think Paul was corrected. Paul was deeply devoted to the God of Jesus Christ. He just didn't recognize that Jesus Christ was of that God. And when he met him, it says that he was blinded. And then he had to go to one of these Christians that he was persecuting to be healed. And then scripture tells us that he went to reflect and study. Now scripture doesn't give us the exact time frame, but church tradition says that Paul spent anywhere from three to ten years before he started his ministry. He spent three to ten years going back over the scriptures that he knew so well, those scriptures that we would call the Old Testament. And within those scriptures, he realized that this Jesus that he encountered on the road to Damascus, he had already encountered in the words of scripture. But it was a case of mistaken identity. Jesus, Paul, persecuted the church because Paul did not know Jesus. But when he met Jesus, he understood. It took time to make sense of what he understood, but he understood. And he went throughout the Mediterranean world telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And in some of those places, he was persecuted. And in some of those places, the seed that he planted took root grew up into churches. But they were churches of people. And if you've ever known people, we can be just the worst, right? We can be the best. But we can be cantankerous. We insist on our own way. We do all of those things that last week in our scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, it says that love is or love is not. Well, each and every one of us can be the exact opposite of that list. Paul certainly was. If you read the scriptures carefully, Paul could be kind of a bully. Paul could be 
he could insist on his own way. He and his dear friend Barnabas had a parting of the ways because they disagreed. But Paul always recognized that out of the human frailty and brokenness, God's purposes still reached out into the world. Indeed, in his argument with Barnabas, that meant instead of two of them going to one place, they would now go to two places. They doubled their witness precisely because they couldn't be in each other's company anymore. So sometimes God's purposes are accomplished in spite of our arguments, our divisions, our disagreements. But in the context of that reality for Paul, in our scripture today, he brings it back to the one thing that unites all of us. It even united Paul and Barnabas, even though they disagreed about whether John Mark should travel with them. And that one thing It's the rock on which we all can stand. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. That is the basis for relationship between every Christian. Do we agree on the method of baptizing, whether we baptize babies or don't? Do we agree on the meaning of Scripture? Do we agree on theology? Do we agree on practice? Do we agree on social issues? No, of course not. But in all of that difference, the one thing we should never lose sight of is Jesus Christ. And if we stand on that one solid rock, and we recognize that somebody that sometimes we might feel like is our enemy or a threat is standing on that same rock, then we are called to receive them with the love of Christ, with the grace that we have received. Doesn't mean we don't have to go our own separate ways like Paul and Barnabas did. But in the end, Paul and Barnabas came back together and reconciled. John Wesley was a uh, close friend of George Whitfield, a very prominent preacher. And John and George had a big falling out because George Whitfield believed in predestination and John Wesley said of predestination that if that were true, it would make God worse than the devil. The point being, sidebar, Predestination is understood by George Whitfield and some others, says that God predestines only certain individuals to be saved. And there's nothing you can do about it if you're not in that list, which John Wesley found horrifying because it's God promising salvation to all, but then not delivering on that promise. Sidebar over. John and George had a big falling out didn't speak well, didn't speak to each other or write to each other or even acknowledge each other's existence for decades. But when George Whitfield got sick and died, what John remembered was not the decades of um, ignoring each other, it was not the anger and the hurt, but it was that they shared the same love for Jesus Christ. John Wesley preached at George Whitfield's funeral, even though they hadn't spoken, and I believe it was about four years. John wept at George Whitfield's funeral. That kind of reconciliation is only possible when we stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the good news of Jesus Christ. When we value Christ more than our own opinion, more than our own belief in anything else, it comes down to Jesus Christ. Now, like Paul, who is abnormally or untimely born, we too 
were untimely born. I'm fairly certain, though I won't say 100%, that I don't know if any of us have ever encountered Jesus face to face like Paul did. If you have, tell me about it. But most of us have encountered Jesus Christ through the witness of another, many others probably, who knew Jesus Christ just as thoroughly and as well and as intimately as if they had walked the roads of Galilee 2,000 years ago with him. In the book of Luke, 24th chapter, I believe, to the day of Jesus' resurrection, the first Easter day, and two followers of Christ are walking from Jerusalem back to their home in the village of Emmaus. And as they were walking, a third person joins them. And they begin talking and they start to say, haven't you heard about what's going on today? And that third person <coughs> says, opened up the scriptures and explained to them how all of the things that happened to Jesus were a fulfillment of scripture. And when they reached their destination, that third person broke bread, just like in communion. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized that this had been the risen Jesus all along. And in that moment, he was gone. And then they ran the seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell everybody else, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> there aren't many times that I've had an encounter with Christ that I've been willing to run seven miles going, you can't believe what happened. Sometimes it's much more subtle. But it's every bit as real as Paul on the road to Damascus. It's those two disciples traveling to Emmaus. I hope and pray that each one of us have had a moment, many moments, where we haven't just believed that the story of Jesus is true, but that we have actually had an encounter with Jesus. If not flesh to flesh or face to face, heart to heart, soul to soul, spirit to spirit. That changes everything. And for all of us who have had that experience, we need to remember that from time to time. We need to reaffirm that, yes, what a friend I have in Jesus. How amazing is his grace. We need to take it from just, yes, we believe, to walking by faith. Taking it to heart. And even though we were not born in a time where Jesus physically walks among us, we are born in a time where the body of Christ, the gathered church, the witnesses of the good news of Jesus Christ walk with us. We walk with each other on that path. We confirm to each other that experience. We encourage one another. We call each other to account when we start to stray. And out of that, we become the people of Christ. We become the community, the followers, not just the believers, but the livers. Well, not the livers. The people who live the way of Christ. And in doing so, like Paul, throughout our journeys in the world, the degree to which Christ is alive in our hearts, I think, is the degree to which we witness. It's important to witness by telling people about Jesus. It's important to witness by living like one who knows Jesus, to be Christ-like in God to give our lives, to take up our cross, 
not insisting on our own way, but being patient and kind and reflecting all those beautiful words in 1 Corinthians 13. We become, we are, the presence of Christ in the world. So this morning, before we receive communion, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, I invite you to recommit your lives and your heart to the living Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to come forward and kneel at the altar, feel free to do so. Um, if you would like me to pray with you in that moment, uh, just sort of wave your hand or nod to me. And if you prefer to just stay in your seat in your pew, that's fine also. But let's take a few moments and give our hearts and our lives to Jesus again. Primary importance, the rock on which we stand and the thing that binds us together, Jesus Christ. We can only give our hearts to Jesus because Jesus first gave himself for us. He loves us so much. That even though as the Son of God we could have commanded angels to come and save him from the cross, from the beating and the whipping and the scourging, and the spear in his eye, and all that he suffered. But instead of seeking to save himself, he gave himself to save us. When we follow Christ, that is the pattern of life that we are called to live. Hopefully, we won't be crucified, and hopefully, we won't be beaten. But there are plenty in the world who would reject us, who would ridicule us. That is not a challenge to be existing. It's an invitation to show the love of Christ. Jesus let his body be broken his blood be spilled so that we might know his love. Let us be willing to love our enemies that we might witness to the love of Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You sit in majesty upon your throne, high and lofty. The hem of your robe fills the temple, while six-winged seraphs fly about your holy seat, proclaiming your glory. Such images are beyond us, we who live in this world. But yet, we proclaim that all of your ways are beyond our understanding and our belief. But with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He called ordinary people to leave their work and to labor for your kingdom. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Will those assisting with communion please come forward? table has been prepared. Our Lord himself invites you to feast with him and upon him. We have prayed the prayer of grace and are now ready to receive. So come, come to the table, come and feast with your Lord Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Use us, even us, now as your disciples. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now rise and sing our final hymn, My Hope is Built. So as we go out this week, remember to love one another with the love of Christ, to forgive one another, especially when the pastor forgets the pastoral prayer, and display the gift that Jesus gives to us by giving it to others, through word, through action, through spirit, through heart, through attitude, through all that we are. May the solid rock upon which we stand give us the firm foundation to grab a hold of others who are standing on that sinking sand and give them hope and give them a foundation as well. So go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and be a blessing in the world, all for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.